So today I want to continue our indigenous learning time. And for this uh, particular installment, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a word which is used by some of the architects of the Indian Act. Uh, actually, its main architect, John A. Macdonald. John A. Macdonald was our first prime minister, and he was also the minister of what then was called Indian Affairs. And I want to read you a quote which gives you a sense of how John A. Macdonald saw Indigenous people back in the 1860s when Canada was founded formally as a country. And it goes like this. I have not hesitated to tell this house again and again that we could not always hope to maintain peace with the Indians, that the savage was still a savage, and that, in, and that it, until he ceased to be a savage, we were always in danger of a collision, in danger of war, in danger of an outbreak. So that's how John A. Macdonald put it to the House of Commons. And that is obviously language which we would never use today, referring to indigenous people as savages. And yet it was extremely common language back in the 1860s. And so to try and understand that, this week I went back in time. I did a little bit of time traveling. And I spent some time reading back issues of uh, Toronto newspapers from the 1860s. And what emerged in, you know, these are, these are the writings of well-educated white men, um, not too many women in the papers back then, uh, well-educated white men from both England as well as Canada. Um, this was the way the educated classes saw things. And they really saw the indigenous issue, which they called the Indian problem, as basically in two ways, because they saw indigenous people in two ways. One was that indigenous people were a lot like Adam and Eve before the fall. They were noble, well-proportioned, innocent, and uh, what Rousseau called noble savages. Their only shortcoming, this camp said, was that they didn't know anything about Jesus and that um, they hadn't settled down yet. They hadn't settled down to become farmers the way any good citizen should be. So they recommended that there was nothing wrong with the indigenous people the way they were. They were actually very, um, there was much to be admired in their culture, but they should really settle down and become more like us in their lifestyle. So that was one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it was that indigenous people were basically uh, going to go extinct very, very soon. This is partially based on the observation that their populations had dropped precipitously since uh, Europeans had arrived in North America, and that was true. Between disease and war, their numbers had come down radically. By 1900, there were about 100,000 indigenous people in Canada spread out across all of Canada, which of course made them a very small population. But the idea was that they, because their lifestyle was based on hunting and gathering, particularly hunting out west, they were going to, extinct, going to go extinct just as the buffalo were going extinct. And that was just the way it was going to happen. It, they felt that there was a sort of inevitability about this. And part of it was to do with the fact that they were going to run out of the food that they liked. And also, it was simply because they had come into contact with what these white writers said was a superior civilization. And having come up as, alongside a superior civilization, of course, theirs would just crumble away. And in 1860, there was a um, newspaper article which read like this, uh, which said that there was basically two choices left to indigenous people in Canada. And I quote, either he will hover on the outskirts of the white man's settlements, carrying off his cattle and putting his life in danger till he comes to be regarded as caput lupinum, which means outlaw, and is shot down without scruple. Or he will be absorbed, nationality and all, by the great assimilative processes of a regular society. What's clear in these newspaper articles was that both camps, the sympathetic and the very unsympathetic, Neither one of them really thought that there was anything valuable about indigenous culture in itself. They, they saw it as a sort of evolutionary throwback, something which couldn't possibly be of value. And they fully expected it just to die out. And the best possible thing that could happen to indigenous people would be to assim be assimilated into white culture. And so 
that idea, which was true for both camps, which you could find in any newspaper of the time, that's what inspired the Indian Act in, um, in 1875 and inspired all those incredibly restrictive rules which came with the Indian Act and which have made indigenous life so difficult in Canada ever since. But if you had told Johnny MacDonald that we'd be talking about this over a hundred years later, he would have laughed. He would have said, impossible. Indigenous people will be long gone by then. They will simply be another type of immigrant to Canada, just like immigrants having assimilated into Canada. No one expected indigenous people to last. They vastly, vastly underestimated the resilience of indigenous people, who even when their ceremonies and languages were outlawed and forbidden, kept doing them anyway. They found ways to maintain their culture, even when it meant breaking the law and keeping it secret. And now they are actually the fastest growing population in all of Canada, numbering about 1.6 million people. So, and one of the things which has come out of this is that they have been organizing, as I've mentioned in other um, talks, they've been organizing with other indigenous groups from around the world. And just two months ago, Canada finally, after over a decade of hard lobbying, Canada finally, at the federal level, adopted the United Nations Declar Declaration on the in Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and this act is critical for indigenous survival all over the world. And I'd like to read just two clauses from it. Indigenous peoples and individuals have the right not to be subjected to forced assimilation or destruction of their culture. Indigenous peoples have the right to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories, and aspirations, which shall be appropriately reflected in education and public information. The Indigenous people of Canada hope that we will take this very, very seriously so that we can have a much better future than we have had as a past with Indigenous peoples. They hope that we will recognize that their culture has much, much to value for themselves, has every reason to persist, regardless of how large or small their population may be, and it may well have things to teach us as well. Johnny MacDonald would find the passage of the adoption of um, this declaration unconscionable and probably horrifying. And it's the distance between what our first prime minister thinks and what we think now, which is how we can measure progress. May we live up to our promises. And so ends our Indigenous learning time for today.